Well, we are going to discuss, as I said, we're going to discuss self-employed borrowers. It may take two weeks to cover it all because I, don't, I know I can't get it done in 30 minutes. But there's a lot of things about self-employed borrowers that I, I felt are important for you to just at least have a basic knowledge of. And so the first question is, what would a lender consider a self-employed borrower? What, what does that mean? I mean, what, who's a self-employed borrower? Everybody. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, realtors. realtors. Now, why would a re you're right, but why would a realtor be a self-employed borrower? They're independent contractors. They're getting, okay. What were you going to say, Casey? W, w Somebody that doesn't have a W-2. That's the simplest way to categorize a self-employed borrower. But we've got to be careful. Can a self-employed borrower receive a W-2 and still be a self-employed borrower? Yes. In what, you're right, in what case? What's that? Uber and DoorDash. Uber? Okay. What else? People with jobs, gig workers. What's that? Gig workers. Like uh, people that do uh, short term gigs. And okay. Possible. That's okay. Somebody's doing short, they're, they're working W 2, they're film industry, but they're, they're not really self employed, though. I'll explain that one. That's a good point, Casey. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, who else? What's that? They've got a few different jobs. Here's when a W, generally speaking, if you just look at the categories, somebody who is not W-2 is self-employed. That's a general rule of thumb that is safe for you and I to use. So you and I are talking to a borrower, and the borrower says, well, if that's the case, then I'm not self-employed because I get a W-2. Exactly. They might still own their own business, and if they own their own business as a sub S or a, or a C Corp, they may be paying themselves a W-2, but they're still self-employed. So the first rule is generally W-2 employees are not self-employed, generally, unless they own the business that is paying them the W-2. So that's the rule. If they're a W-2 employee, they're not self-employed unless the company paying them the W-2, they own. How much of the company do they have to own to be considered self-employed in the mortgage business? 51%. How much? 51. 51, no. Somebody else. Good guess, though. That would be the one most of us would guess. 45. 45, no. Nope, 25%. If you own 25% of the business, you are considered self-employed, period. All right? That's an important thing to know because when you're talking to people, it's amazing how many people will tell me, well, I get a W-2, so I'm not self-employed. Well, wait a minute once. Do you own any portion of the business? Yes, how much of the business? I don't own most of the business. How much of the business do you own? Well, I own... 30%. Okay, you're considered self-employed. That means we're going to fall under self-employed rules. People don't like to always hear that, but it's what happens. Casey? Never mind. Never you, mind. Never, yeah. Okay, so any questions before I go on? Dave? And you may be able to cover this, but what is, what is the big difference between self-employed and W-2? Why don't people like hearing that? Oh, David's got a great question. Why do people prefer not having to hear about being self-employed versus W-2? What makes the big difference? And the big difference is the amount of documentation. The amount of documentation on self-employed is significantly greater. Plus, we're going to go into it now in a moment, that's the biggest one. So more documentation. But the other side of it is people will tell me all the time, Kobe, to what you brought up, they get 1099s, okay? 1099 means that they're self, that's independent contractor. So what people say, I, I made $90,000 last year. I said, okay, you made $90,000. Was that your gross receipts? Is that what you received on your 1099? Yeah, it was about 90,000. I said, okay, how much did your accountant write off? Well, I don't know. 
Well, did they, I'm sure they wrote something off. If they wrote something off, I can't use 90. I have to use the amount that they that the net after the write-off. And we're going to talk about that right now. And that's the number that I can use. So, David, that's the second reason why people prefer not having, because they can't use their gross receipts even though they're living off their gross receipts. I can only use the amount they actually pay taxes on. We'll go into that in a minute. Tom? And what about length of, uh, on the job? Length of time in self-employment. We're going to go over that in a minute. Great question. All right? So let's, let's just start with W-2 employee means, generally speaking, not self-employed. Unless the money for the W-2 is coming from a company that that person owns at least 25% of, then it's considered self-employed. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you categories of how you might see a self-employed borrower. So the first self-employed borrower, the simplest one, many of you as real estate agents, you are a 1099 contractor that Mike and Dwayne and Karen give you at the end of the year, 1099, showing you what you grossed over the course of the year. And in, some, in many of your cases, not everybody, many of your cases, that 1099 income flows into your federal tax return on Schedule C. C for cat. That's all it does. You don't have an LLC set up. You don't have anything else. It's just the money flows. You get the, pay, you get the 1099. You get your paychecks. It goes right to Schedule C. Now, I have sat in this room more than one time over the last couple of years, and I've heard Mike talk about the absolute importance of paying taxes on a regular basis. It's amazing how many 1099 people that money goes right to their Schedule C, they get to the end of the year and they end up with a tax liability, depending on how much they made. I've seen some people have as much as 25, 30, 35,000 in tax liability. Don't answer this question, don't raise your hands, just think about it for a minute. If you've got a tax liability, find out in February from your accountant that you owe the government $25,000, how many of you would be excited about writing that check or even can write that check? That's why Mike stands up here at least once a year and goes over with you the absolute importance of paying taxes on the money when you receive it or at least quarterly. That's the first thing because tax liability issues can be big deals when you're trying to buy a house. So anyway, that's the first uh, and by the way, Casey, that's one of the reasons that uh, you, you know you know where I'm going. Okay, good. Um, so Casey's got a client, and him and I are working on it. There, there's an issue there. So, but in any event, so it goes from 1099 straight to your Schedule C. Now, in many cases, some of you have set up what's called an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. That Limited Liability Corporation does some protection for you in the form of liability. You don't have anything, you don't have a partnership set up, you don't have an S-Corp set up, it's just an LLC, and that LLC is registered with the state of Georgia, so when the money comes in, it goes to the L, it's paid to the LLC, which still goes to your Schedule C, which still does the exact same thing. If you've never seen a Schedule C, let me know, I can, you can go to the IRS website, ask for a Schedule C, it'll print it out. Top section of the L, um, after it gets you your basic information, is your gross receipts. The second section are all of your expenses. You get down to about line, I forget what it is, I think it's line 31 is where it says your net income after expenses. That's the amount you pay taxes on, that's the amount the lender can use to determine your income. So Schedule C is the first one, the simplest one, even if it's an LLC, just simple, just flows right to, the, right to that one document. We look at that document, we make the determination. But think about that person who's, they're a psychiatrist and they've got, you know, their own, um, they get 1099, they get income. However, or the film industry, some of them is 1099 income. You folks, 1099 income. Money goes straight to your Schedule C and you think you've made 120,000 and by the time Greg finally looks at your tax return and says, wait a minute once. Have 120,000. Your accountant's doing a fabulous job. 
They wrote off 50% of it. You're making 60. Yeah, but Greg, I really don't. I mean, I, I'm paying for my car. Good gosh. Or the gas. Or my house. Or all these things. Hey, all those things are expenses. They come off the, they come off the top line, end up at the bottom line. It's what you paid taxes on. That's what we can use. Very important. So first one, Schedule C. Now, let's twist it up a little bit. And now, there are times when it makes sense to set up something called an S-corporation, sub-S-corporation. I'm not going to get into the accounting side of it because I'm not that good, but I can tell you what happens. Now, now the money is paid to the sub-S-corp. And there's an actual form 1065 that has to be filled out. There's an actual tax return that is filled out that the federal government has. So if you've got an S corporation, all of that revenue, all of those expenses, instead of going to Schedule C, it now goes to your S corporation tax return. The form isn't terribly different. It's got the top section are your gross receipts, then it's got all of your expenses. It shows what you've made, but that's not the end of it. Because on an S corporation, you will receive something called a K-1. I'm not trying to make it complicated, but you'll get a K-1. The K-1 will show how much of the company you own versus someone else. It shows how much in distributions you took out this year. It's going to show a variety of different things. And lenders have to calculate income off of the K-1, not the form 10, not page 1065. I have had clients that are independent contractors that they come in and they're like, Casey, we want to buy a year. And I'm like, great, make sure that you work with your tax professional mm -hmm. to allow you to qualify for more or mm -hmm. whatever you want to qualify for. Uh, it's one of those things where you gear up to buy a house the year before you buy the Correct. house. Correct. At sometimes two years, but yes, at least one year, you want to gear up for it. That's what you're bringing up. Absolutely. So if you're an S corporation, the money just flows into the S corporation first. It then produces a K-1 at the end of the year, and the lender's going to use the K-1 to help determine income. We're going to add back some expenses, such as depreciation, depletion, some of those things we can add back. So that's the... That's the next thing. Now, here's the thing about an S corporation, and this is where lenders have to be very careful. S corporation is one of those situations where they can pay themselves a W-2. I see a lot of people that have got S corporations that pay themselves a salary, $2,000, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 a month. They have a lot of income coming in, but they don't want to take, or they don't need all that income to live off of. So they take $4,000 a month in this example, and they pay themselves a salary just as though they worked for Home Depot. And that, that salary of $4,000 a month is going to get a W-2, <clears throat> and that's going to flow on page one of their 1040, and we're going to see that. So now we're going to take all of their distributions off of the K-1 to give them income credit for and give them credit for the $4,000 a month, in this case $48,000 annually, that they've paid themselves. So though that's a situation where they can make W-2 income off of the business that they own. Does that make sense? Now, some people are going to get W-2 income in that manner, but they're not going to do a normal salary. They're just going to take quarter, monthly or quarterly bonuses based on how much is in that account. So they may have $80,000 in the account, and they decided, you know what, this month or this quarter or whatever, I'm going to take a distribution, that's what it's called, of $30,000. Now they take a distribution from their S corporation in the form of a payroll check that taxes are taken out of. That's the beauty of doing it through payroll. 
because taxes are automatically coming out, Medicare's coming out, you know, state taxes coming out. That's why a lot of people will do it that way. They take that distribution or in the form of a W payroll, ends up in a W-2, shows up on page one of the 1040. You don't have to remember all of that. That's our job. But what you need to be aware of is that that's how people pay themselves. And when someone says, I'm just getting a W-2 anyway, well, okay, good, but that doesn't mean you're not self-employed. Now let's go to Tom's question. How long must I be self-employed before I can go ahead and get a loan, and how many years of tax returns am I going to require? Very variety of answers. First of all, if you are self-employed, the minimum that you can be self-employed is two years before we can use your, because we have to have two years of tax returns in order to determine your income. And I'll give you the instances where we only need one, but that's coming. But right now, <clears throat> so over the weekend, I had a chat with an individual who had their, um, their company was set up at the end of 2019, and he had heard this thing that he has two years well, he's just about two years because he's all of 2020, but he's got 2021. He says, Greg, I'd I can get my profit and loss to you, blah, blah, blah. I just want to get this done so we can buy something in January or February. I said, slow down. Slow down. I have to have two years of tax returns before I can determine income. Greg, I'll give you a profit and loss. No, I got to have two years of tax returns. He said, well, that means I'm not, if I don't file my taxes until March or April, that means I can't buy a house until then. I said, that's exactly the case. We're going to have two years of tax returns. And then he says, well, my 2020 is going to look a whole lot better than 2019. I said, that's fabulous. Or 2021 is going to look a whole lot better than 2020. And I said, well, that's fabulous. What was 2020? He said, Greg, we didn't make much. You know, we, we had been in business about 13 months, and he said, you know, we probably made somewhere in the area of maybe 40000 after expenses. I said, okay, so that's forty. He said, I don't want you to use that. I want you to use what I'm making in 2021. I said, I can use 2021 as an average. He said, Greg, that's going to kill me. I'm trying to buy a house for $800,000. I got more than enough money to do this. But he says, Greg, if you're only going to take an average of 2019 and 20 or 2020 and 2021, Greg, I'm not going to make it. I, I'm sorry. Let's see if now there is another alternative. Go back a couple weeks. We talked about the bank statement loan. You can probably do that, but let's not go there. We're talking about self-employed on traditional lending. So I've got to have two years tax returns, and I'm going to take an average of those two years. Now Will I always be using an average as a lender? The answer is no. If the 2021 tax return shows less than 2020, then I don't take the average, then I use what he made in 2021. Now, think about what happened in 2020. 2020, COVID hit. There were a lot of people in business who the business during 2020 went down because of COVID. 2020, 2019, 2018 was fine. 2020 went down. So if I'm doing their loan in 2021, I'm looking at 2019, 2020 tax return. I can't use 2019 because it's too high. 2020 was less. I had to give them less credit. Now, there are some ways around that. Sometimes we can go to underwriting, which I did several times this year. Let me have 2018 and 2019 and 2020. I had all three years. I took an average. The only other thing I've got to do then is use the profit and loss this year to make sure that the profit and loss this year substantiates what we're using for actual income. A lot of little twists that the lender can use. So it gets, so Tom, generally two years. Now, there is an exception to that. If you have been in business for five years, if you've had your own sub S corporation, or if you have been an independent contractor just putting things, yes? I've heard instances and I've heard people talk about it where if you go to college and your university major deals with what your industry is, employment, you can get loans based on that. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm trying, I'm trying to find it right now. I see. But I've heard that a couple times. Who? Okay. If you've been a student and you're trying to get a loan. Yeah. And your major was directly related to your, if you're a civil engineer, you went straight into engineering. Okay. Let me answer that in a second. Okay, because you can't, but let me answer that in a moment. Let's go back to where I was going. You've been in business for five years. You've either had your own corporation for five years or more that we can prove, or you've been an independent contractor moving everything into your sub S, uh, moving everything into your Schedule C because you didn't make it, you didn't set up a sub S or anything else. You've been in business for five years. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will generally let us use just one year of tax return rather than have to have two. But you must be in business for a minimum of five years. Now, here's what happens in a lot of cases. People are independent contractors as real estate agents, and they've been in business now six years. But the first three years or four years, they were Schedule C. In other words, independent contractor went to Schedule C. Now they changed it three years later, and they became a sub-S corporation. Now, technically, they are still a real estate agent, just that it went from a Schedule C to a Sub S. Unfortunately, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac don't see it that way. You are now a new corporation. You've been in business three years. We have to have two years tax returns. So five years as the same entity, self-employed, would mean only one year of tax return. Tom, does that help? Yes. Okay. Now, before I answer the question here, I, I know I've thrown a ton of information. We're going to do this again next week, but we'll break it down a little bit different. Um, questions before I go on. My gosh, geniuses, that dancing really helps. I love this. All right, question. If somebody is a, if, if I can prove that you're a student, that you went to school, get a copy of your transcripts, copy of your degree, and then you came out of college and within 60, 90 days, whatever, you started working for a company as a W-2 employee. School is considered employment. It is. You don't have to be working there. I just have to have your transcripts and your degree and show, and then you've got a new job, you've just started it, now I can use that, you can get the loan. If you decide to do that, go to school, and then start your own business, you gotta wait a minimum of two years of tax returns. Can you be in school and employed in the same, does it matter if you're in the same field? No, There's not really, need. not really. We can stretch that, we can make that. But, but, but school can be considered School is considered employment. employment. So, so I, if I'm in school right now, mm -hmm. and I'm doing real estate, I still need two years, is that what you're saying? Absolutely, right. gotta have two years. Two years, so two years of school? Two years of tax returns because your income is coming from your self-employment. Your school's not where your income is, right? Yeah, there's some shaking out right now. Okay, so your money's coming from real estate. Two years right. of tax returns. So is school saying, is there a certain amount of time you have to be working at that job for you guys to use it? Not necessarily. Not unless there's a long gap of employment from the time you came out of school to the time you started your job. But if it's inside 90 days, no big deal. Would GPA be? What's that? Would GPA affect the loan? No, not at all. GPA does not affect the loan. Uh, I kind of have a question. So let's say somebody goes to school for, they study IT. They start working, uh, but they are there for like six months and they start If they're under a contract and the contract has an end date that ends within 36 months of the time that they are going to close that loan, can't use the income. Okay. What about if they, they switch to like a full-time employee? No problem. So can they use the time they're with other companies? Yes. Time or yeah. start no, we can, we can, no, that's a good question, Ami. We can use that income. Yes. All right. I threw a lot at you today. I think the most important thing, the takeaway, and then I'll talk about what we're gonna go over next week. The takeaway is this. Anybody who's not W-2 is generally speaking a self-employed borrower unless 
the W-2 income is coming from the company that they own 25% of. That's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two, think in terms of Schedule C on the tax return, simplest form, 1099, goes to Schedule C. Think of Sub S Corporation, which is a company that they own, generally speaking, in its entirety themselves, 50% of it, whatever it happens to be, and the money is, the income we're going to use is going to be whatever they paid themselves based off of the K-1 and any W-2 income that they may have paid themselves. That's takeaway number two. Takeaway number three. Generally speaking, two years tax returns, unless we can prove that they've been in business for five years, same entity, then we might be able to have only use one year of, of income, one year of tax returns, excuse me. Now, what I'm going to do next week is I'm going to take some of these forms and I'm going to put them up on the screen for you so you can see the form and actually see what it, I'm talking about. And I'm going to talk about C corporations. You don't see it as much, but you'll have people who are the owner of a C corporation, which is treated very differently than a sub S. And C corporations give a, even more flexibility, but you just don't see a lot of it. But we'll talk about that one next week. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir.